You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. It's been a tough few years for any product that travels by ship, anyone waiting for those products to arrive, and especially anyone who has to figure out how that product gets from A to B. Overseas, those COVID lockdowns in China are again threatening the global supply chain. Hundreds of ships at anchor off the port of Shanghai. The situation has some companies warning of new price hikes. A giant container ship wedged from bank to bank, blocking one of the world's most important shipping lanes. Shipping companies are increasingly rerouting away from the Red Sea and Suez Canal to avoid the dangers. Ever since the pandemic struck, Supply chain issues have plagued the world. And every time global shipping seems to be getting close to back to normal, a new conflict breaks out, a new disaster strikes, or Mother Nature just says, nope. The Panama Canal is one of the world's most important trading routes, and it's in desperate need of water. The canal is going through its driest spell in more than a century as El Nino brings higher temperatures and less rain. For months now, traffic through the Panama Canal has been slowed. And it is getting worse, not better, with no end in sight. Is this just El Nino? Is it the climate crisis showing us the future? of global cargo transport. And if this is the future, then what other shipping lanes might be opening up as this one dries out? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Mia Dahl is a freelance journalist based in Mexico City who covers the shipping industry, especially the Panama Canal. Hello, Mia. Hi, Jordan. Before we talk about just the canal that you're looking at specifically, there's a bigger picture here. Maybe could you summarize kind of for our listeners how global shipping supply chains have been doing over the last four and five years? I feel like there's been a lot of problems. Yeah, you're right, Jordan. A lot has happened. Like for a starter, the COVID-19 pandemic was a massive shock to global shipping Mm -hmm. and global supply chains in general, of course. We saw lockdowns, port closures, shortages of containers, which was actually already happening before the pandemic, but then got a lot worse. And that also increased freight costs and and delays. But on top of that, supply chains have also been disrupted by geopolitical tensions like Russia's war in Ukraine, which blew up in in February 2022, Mm -hmm. and and the U.S.-China trade war, and then latest also the conflict in the Middle East since, since October 7th. Um, so all of these events bring increased uncertainty and disrupted uh, production chains uh, and, of course, huge disruptions to trade and shipping. And then lately, things just got a lot worse for international shipping as we see that the two most important shipping shortcuts in the world uh, have been severely disrupted. We're talking about the Panama Canal, where a drought has led the Panama Canal Authority to cut traffic in half. And a war in the Middle East that has spread, uh, which caused serious issues with passage through the Suez Canal as Yemen's Iran-backed Houthis have been attacking commercial vessels in the Red Sea since October last year. These Houthis have carried out over 30 attacks on international shipping. Mm -hmm. On January 11th, we saw a response from the U.S. and U.K. military. Uh, They lost their first attacks on 60 Houthi targets around 16 locations in Yemen which was supported by Canada and other countries. So, yeah, you're right, Jordan. There's definitely a lot of problems for global shipping right now. And I think the situation in the Middle East has, uh, to your point, raised a lot of headlines. Mm -hmm. Until I read your reporting, I had no idea that the Panama Canal uh, was in similar trouble. So maybe as we explain that, just first for listeners who are unfamiliar, how important is this canal to global shipping and to North American shipping? Like, obviously, it's a key route, but can you give us a sense of scale of, of what goes on there? Yeah, so the Panama Canal is extremely important. We're talking about about 5% of the world's seaborne trade that goes through this canal, which is like 300 billion US dollar worth of cargo in a single year that goes through the canal. And regionally, it's even more important with about 40% of US container traffic going through the canal. 
And then if you think about Panama as a country, of course, the canal is very important. It's a source of not just a national pride, it's also a main driver of the entire economy, responsible for about uh, 6.6% of uh, the country's GDP last year. So, so it's very important both globally, regionally, and for Panama as a country. So explain the drought. Uh, when did it start? How bad is it? What's happening? Yeah, so the drought has really plagued the country since uh, last year. The Panama is usually one of the rainiest countries in the world, but last year we began to see much less rain uh, than usual. For instance, in October, we saw uh, 41% less precipitation than usual. And in December, the Lake Gatun, which is the main reservoir that feeds into the canal, uh, reached record low water levels. So yeah, it's it's quite severe. What happens exactly when uh, water levels get low in the canal and in the, the lakes that feed into it? The canal doesn't operate like it's supposed to. Uh, there's these three nearby freshwater lakes that serve as reservoirs that feed water into the Panama Canal. And because of the way the canal works, it pumps water from these lakes into a set of locks that are then used to lift and lower ships to transit them in and out of the canal. But we're talking about massive amount of water that the, the canal uses to do this. It uses around 52 million gallons of water uh, to transit a single ship through, which is equivalent to about 80 Olympic-sized swimming pools or what half a million Panamanians would consume in, in a day hmm. just to transit a single ship. So it's massive amounts of water that then go straight out into the ocean. What happens um, if they don't have this water? Like, I guess what I'm trying to understand is what are they doing to get ships through now? I know they're doing fewer of them, but mm -hmm. um, is it just a matter of like how much it can bear? It's both a matter of how much it can bear and how much cargo the ships that they do let through can take uh, because it also affects like the level of depth that the ships can sit at. So this has meant that the Panama Canal Authority has introduced a series of restrictions. Some of them relate to, you know, the amount of cargo that the ships can take on, but also especially the amount of traffic that goes through. So basically, the Panama Canal Authority has been cutting traffic in half uh, from around 36, 38 ships a day before the crisis started to an expected 18 ships a day in February. So it's really quite uh, dramatic measures that have been taken, which mean, of course, not just fewer ships let through, but also long wait times. Uh, at some point in August, we saw more than 160 ships waiting to get through the canal. Mm -hmm. And I see right now that backlog has been reduced because ships are no longer just waiting to get through because that option has become really difficult. So instead, they have started to either pay fees to skip the line. Right. Some fees have really spiraled. These options have been seen as high as $4 million to let a single ship through. And some ships also decide to reroute. So who determines then? Uh, you mentioned the auction. I'd like to hear more about that. And also just if there was 36 ships, now there's 18. Uh, who makes that call and uh, how, uh, how much money is at stake here? So basically, the Panama Canal Authority is in control of these restrictions. And they've been doing a lot of things to try to save water. I was uh, talking to representatives of the Panama Canal Authority, and they described how they've built water basins to, uh, to save more water, how they're trying to do simultaneous lockage of ships so that more ships can go through in the same passage and, and less water can be wasted. They've tried to take all these measures, but it's not really enough. And when there's not enough water, in the end, they do have to let less ships through in order not to compromise the water safety for the general population, because we're talking about fresh water. So this enters into a competition for water with both the general population and with other activities. And, and tensions are really high in the country right now, because uh, last year we saw already that Panama had protests related to a mining concession actually to a Canadian company called uh, First Quantum. Uh, they had this local subsidiary called Mineria Panama, which was granted a 20-year concession at least to run a huge copper mine. Hmm. But of course, uh, these activities can be environmentally damaging and they require a lot of water. So water is really at the top of the agenda for Panamanians right now as they think about how to ensure water for 
population that consumes massive amounts of water. Panamanians consume 2.5 times more than the world average of water. And then, you know, you have these activities, mining and the canal it, itself, which which uses uh, huge amounts of water. So, mm-hmm. so there's these tensions and and this competition for water going on right now. What do we know about the drought itself? You mentioned it began last year. Um, is there a special system or effect going on here? Do we have an idea of when it might end? Or, um, you know, as we've uh, seen in places here in Canada, is this possibly just the new normal? So a lot of things are going on. This is definitely related to climate change. Uh, it's also related to a weather phenomena that we know as El Nino, right. which has been very strong this past year. El Nino is this weather phenomena that reoccurs every two to seven years associated with higher ocean temperatures and a displacing of trade winds that would have otherwise brought more rain to tropical countries like Panama. This is something that has affected the region more widely. For instance, I'm in Bogota right now in Colombia. This past week, I've been able to see smoke from fires in the mountains right next to the capital And there's been at least 21 forest fires around the country destroying important ecosystems and threatening communities. So Hmm. there's a lot of effects in the entire region related to this weather phenomena, El Nino, which has been particularly strong. And the climate experts say are strongly related to human-induced climate change. And of course, this El Nino has affected Panama too. And This is really set to only get worse because Panama usually has these rainy and dry seasons. And we've seen that this problem has been very severe over the past months that were supposed to be rainy seasons, but have been a lot drier than usual. But right now, the country is heading into dry seasons. So all through the spring, this is only set to get worse. Do we have any idea of the impact uh, of the canal delays on the speed and the cost of goods in general? Like I'm trying to get a measure of just how much this will hit consumers. It's hard to put exact numbers to this because there's so many things happening simultaneously. As we talked about, the crisis in the Suez Canal is happening at the same time. So shipping is really, you know, turned upside down all over the world. Right. But we do know that this is uh, leading to higher costs for consumers. Uh, Shipping has become more expensive. And I talked to some shipping experts who uh, told me that, you know, the shipping industry has already been consolidating. So we see fewer players that are larger. Lately, with these increased costs of shipping, that tendency has been accelerated because only the big shipping companies can really afford to incur the increased cost of shipping right now to either skip the line or reroute. Mm-hmm. We're talking about massive distances to find other routes for shipping companies. And only the big players can afford to pay this. So shipping consolidation is being accelerated. Then we're seeing these other tendencies like nearshoring, which is this phenomena of moving production closer to the market. So for instance production that was previously happening in China or Southeast Asia, moving to countries like Mexico, Canada, or the U.S. itself. Huh. So it it really has quite uh, wide implications. What options, if any, does Panama have for the future of the canal if it's simply not going to be as wet and as plentiful in terms of water as it has been? Yeah, so... The Panama Canal definitely needs to resolve its water problem. And they already knew that before this crisis, but resolving the water problem has become the absolute top of their agenda. There's several things that the Panama Canal Authority can do. And the most obvious solution is probably to dam up the nearby Indio River and drill a tunnel through a nearby mountain to ensure increased water supply to some of these reservoirs. Huh. But That option is not an immediate one. It'll take around six years, experts estimate, to to do this project. It requires political uh, approval, which looks a little bit difficult ahead of presidential elections in May in the country and with all these tensions that we talked about. So yeah, there are solutions, but they're not immediate. In terms of the big picture, as we look at global shipping in the era of climate change, Might we see 
new routes or companies look for different ways uh, to get goods from point A to point B. And I mean, one of the reasons I ask this is because up here in Canada, there has been some talk about uh, a northern passage becoming much more viable as the Arctic warms. Yeah, that's definitely something I hear from uh, both shipping experts, infrastructure experts. So we've already seen an increased use of other routes. The Panama Canal crisis started before the crisis in the Suez Canal. So back then we saw a lot of ships that started to reroute through the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal. The other options uh, are a lot longer, like Chile's Strait of Magellan or South Africa's Cape of Good Hope. But then we're also seeing increased competition for infrastructure. So we're seeing a railway project in Mexico, uh, which they say uh, is supposed to partly bypass the Panama Canal. We're seeing a a biocenic corridor, which is also a land-based option going through Chile, Argentina, Paraguay and Brazil as another attempt to bypass uh, in Colombia. The president, Gustavo Petro, has mentioned possibility of building an electric train. These options are, a lot of them, uh, not able to directly compete with the Panama Canal. Then there's, of course, the Canadian option, which is quite interesting because as we see that climate change is making things a lot more difficult for the Panama Canal, it might actually benefit shipping routes in the Canadian Arctic Mm -hmm. as ice is melting faster and these routes are starting to open up. But most experts agree that this is still not viable for various reasons. These routes are still very unsafe because of the ice, but also environmentalists are, of course, very concerned about leading big shipping through uh, these vulnerable ecosystems. So it's not without concerns and it's not an immediate solution to create a bypass to the Panama Canal. So there's no doubt that the Panama Canal will remain one of the most important shipping routes. Last question. When you talk to people in the industry, from shipping companies to companies trying to move their goods to people in in the authorities that oversee things like the Panama Canal, what's their sense of what the future is going to be like and how chaotic global shipping has become and how long it'll remain that way? Yeah, so I definitely hear a lot of nervousness in the industry. People have had to deal with a lot of problems uh, in the last four to five years, as we talked about. And this just only seems to be getting worse. There's a bit of hope with these new projects that I mentioned. But honestly, shippers are also quite skeptical because Mm -hmm. big shipping companies need a lot of reliability. They can't just reroute from one day to another. And a lot of these goods really need to arrive on time. So they don't want to bet on some unreliable new option. They're concerned about both security, about arriving on time. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, pessimism in the industry. Mia, thank you so much for walking us through this. It's uh, quite a time for global shipping, I guess. It is indeed. Thank you, Jordan, for having me. Mia Dahl, reporting on the Panama Canal. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head off to thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you've got feedback or a request for a topic, you can send it to us. We read everyone and listen to everyone, either via email, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca, or by leaving a voicemail. The number is 416-935-5935. The Big Story is in every single podcast player. It arrives every weekday, at 4 a.m. Eastern, occasionally even, on the weekends, also at 4 a.m. Eastern, unless we sleep in and forget to press the button. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.